So, osteoporosis, what is it? What about bone? It's not osteoporitis, it's osteoporosis. All right, so it's the loss of bone mass, right? So we have porous bone. So if any of you guys um, look at a nice, big, solid block of cheese, you know, like maybe cheddar or, you know, pepper jack, it's nice and solid. But Swiss cheese has some holes in it, so it doesn't make it as solid and it's not as firm and durable. So you could probably think of osteoporosis that way unless you have another type of analogy. All right, so... Um, what are some signs, or actually, what happens with osteoporosis? How does that manifest? How does that unfold? Okay, so it happens because of old age, but what's the pathophysiology behind it? What are we lacking? And what else are we lacking? What decreases as we get older? What hormone? Estrogen. All right, so estrogen is responsible for some of that bone building and then also the calcium. We also need vitamin D because vitamin D helps to absorb calcium. So if we don't have a lot of vitamin D, then we're going to lack vitamin C, or, okay, or we're going to lack calcium. Um, so what are some risk factors for osteoporosis? So we said old age. Age is always a risk factor for something, right? Um, female, okay. Premenopause, postmenopause, postmenopause, okay. Okay, so you can have, uh, you could be a risk factor for someone who had parathyroidectomy. So now since you brought that up, let's go ahead and explain why that would be a risk factor for osteoporosis. Because those are the outer glands, the brittle glands, and the thyroid that regulate your calcium. They degrade degrade bone tissue if you need more calcium in your blood, and they add to the bone mass if there's too much calcium. Okay, so if you had a parathyroid disorder, that could also be a risk factor or a cause for osteoporosis. How about someone who has had previous um, fractures? Would they be at risk for osteoporosis? Yeah. yeah. All right, so um, when someone has osteoporosis, um, what are some of the signs that you see with someone who has osteoporosis? Brittle bones, right, because they're not as porous as they used to be, so they break easily. Okay, the height decreases. So, you know, that space in between your vertebrae, you know, starts to decrease. Yes, they get a round back, so they get that hump back. Okay. Um, cigarette smoking. Someone who's a cigarette, who smokes cigarettes is at risk for osteoporosis, um, a couple other risk factors is um, excessive alcohol intake. So when we drink a lot of alcohol, we have decreased absorption of vitamins in our GI tract. And then um, also someone who's on high doses of steroids or they're a chronic steroid user. And who would that, who would that be? COPD. Our COPD patients. Um, and that COPD is also relevant to the, you know, emphysema and bronchitis as well. Those are COPD um, disease processes. Um, medications can put us at risk for osteoporosis. So what are some of those medications? Okay. So the steroids put you at risk for um, osteoporosis. And then someone who has inactivity, someone who's not moving around a lot, right? Um, so now since you have discussed some of the risk factors, then your treatments and your education should be relevant to those risk factors, right? So if we smoke cigarettes, what are we going to do? Stop. We're going to provide education to our patient to stop smoking cigarettes. Um, can we help if someone's on steroids, chronic steroid users? No. no, but what can we do? Encourage them to high calcium vitamin D. Okay, so supplements, exercise, eating. Okay, um, we have modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors in a lot of disease processes. So, um, Morgan, what's a 
non-modifiable risk factor? Your gender. Okay, so your gender. And uh, age, yes, definitely age. All right, there are three types of categories um, for medications that are used to treat osteoporosis. And those are your biophosphonates, your hormone replacement therapies, and your serums, your serum um, uh, or your selective estrogen receptor modulators. Um, be familiar with those medications and their action. Your biphosphonates, your hormone replacements, and your selective estrogen receptors. They're on page, uh, they're like your fifth or sixth page over in your PowerPoint slide. Mm -hmm. So, yep, just, you know, is something a estrogen mimicking drug? Does the drug help to rebuild tissue or prevent breakdown? Um, so you're going to be looking at um, that, okay? Mm, just looking at one more thing here. All right. Um, and that's pretty much it for osteoporosis, SNS, short and sweet. Um, so risk factors. Treatments, okay, treatments, medications, what do they do? What are the medications that fall under those different categories? So one thing that's not up on the board is compartment syndrome, and that's one of the things that is associated with this module. Who can tell me what compartment syndrome is? Okay. So, um, Nicole, Nicole, what are one of the signs and symptoms of someone who has compartment syndrome? I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Swelling. Yes, we have swelling. Um, Derek, what's another sign? Pain. Pain. All right, why do we have pain, Courtney? Because um, it's swelling so much, it's pushing Okay, so pushing against what specifically? Okay, so muscles, nerves, veins, uh, you know, it's pushing against everything. There can be stiffness. There can be stiffness. Um, so you're going to have that, you know, that undescribable or that retractable pain. Um, do you remember hearing that word before, retractable? Retractable pain means that it doesn't go away, that it gets worse and worse no matter, you know, what you take because you have that excessive swelling of the fluid. And usually someone who is at risk for compartment syndrome is someone who has had what done, Tyler? Surgery, right. So usually that's your surgery patients or your patients who have had a crushed injury. Like maybe you got a leg smashed in between, you know, two bumpers of a car, all right, so it starts that inflammation cascade, and so it doesn't know when to stop, so the swelling just keeps growing and growing and growing and growing and growing, and, you know, it doesn't stop, you know, so to fix that, we have to do something called a what? I forget what it's called. Hush you. You've answered enough questions. Thank you. Fasciotomy? All right. So fasciotomy, and that's where they go in, and they cut the skin, they cut down to the muscles, and it helps relieve that pressure, and it gets rid of that excessive fluid. Fasciotomy, F-A-S-C-I-O-T-O-M-Y, fasciotomy. Fasci muscle otomy opening, fasciotomy. All right, so we have someone who has had a, um, a fasciotomy done. Right, and I already described what it is. It's a cutting of the, you know, the muscles, the skin, and, you know, everything else that's there. And so now you have that excessive release of the fluid and the pressure. So we heal from the inside out, right? So how are we going to take care of that, that surgical site? Okay, so... 
Okay, so we're, going, we're, we're healing from the inside out, right? Because we have to heal layer by layer, okay? So we have to keep that area moist because we can't let it dry out, right? If it dries out, then it causes cell tissue death. And so we can't let it dry out. So it has to stay moist. Um, definitely a very sterile, you know, procedure because your patient's at risk for infection. <clears throat> so we have to do everything that we can to prevent infection, but at the same time, we need to provide comfort, right? They've had surgery, there's going to be pain, there's some tissue um, impairments, there's definitely some perfusion, you know, impairment. So we have to make sure that our nursing actions are geared toward, toward preventing those things um, from happening and making sure that um, infection doesn't occur. So. This is NUR 170. This is common sense because all of you have probably had a cut on your finger or had some type of infection, and the signs and symptoms don't change. They're the same, right? So be familiar with your signs and symptoms of infection. Okay. Um, signs and symptoms that are objective are things that we can see. So we can see redness, we can see pain, we can see swelling. But then we also have to get an objective point of view and to make sure that, um, you know, we're asking our patient, is there, are they in pain? You know, what the number is, what the quality is. Is it intermittent? Does it come and go? And then our treatment should be very um, specific to our patient's pain. Last module, we talked about different medications that can get ordered for pain. So we can have something very basic like Tylenol, Motrin, you know, then bumping it up to you know, Toradol or an opioid like morphine or, you know, Percocet, narcotics. So, you know, you have different levels of pain medication, and so they're going to be relevant to um, that your patient's pain. So just make sure that you do that, and if there isn't anything in place that you call a doctor and you get something in between for breakthrough pain. <clears throat>